Okay. <laughs> On that fun little note, welcome everyone. I hope everyone's having a wonderful time at Comic Con here on our today. I hope everyone's had some fun panels, despite the miserable weather. Um, this is fan art. Teaching it is okay. My name is Katie Sika. I kind of started this whole panel actually for the Art Educators Association, first for Connecticut, and then I tried to get it in for an EA. To my left here. Hi, my name is Janine Sapphire. <laughs> and then we have at the end. I'm Rachel Branham. And so uh, just a quick little overview. I've been an art educator for about 10, this is actually my 10th year. Um, so yes, I'm not in single digits. Uh, I teach, uh, right, currently right now I teach pre-K to eight. And I question my sanity many days. <laughs> Um, I'm also a art artist alley. I am, I'm also a fan artist as well. I go to conventions, not as big as Comic Con, and I actually do go and sell my own artwork. And then a little bit of um, for yourself. Hello, uh, I am too a artist from Artist Alley. I also am a YouTube personality as well. Um, I do a lot of fan art. I am not a fan artist by trade, but I am a working artist. Um, I currently teach at a uh, public high school in Northeastern, or Northeastern Massachusetts uh, high school right now. Um, this is my 11th year, so wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I also am a big fan of comics, I'm a big fan of all fandoms that exist here, and I truly support fan art in a lot of like meaningful ways, so that's why I'm thrilled to be part of this presentation today. All righty. And so, just to give you guys a really basic overview of what we're going to be talking about here. So, we're going to talk about several different aspects about fan art and the best ways to kind of approach it with children as well as teaching it to children. We're going to talk about some of the brain approaches, some of the psychological effects, as well as, especially for our older students, knowing the legality of some of this. We all have, obviously, our own experience with students as well as fan art, both professionally and personally. Just to let you guys know, this is a lot of our kind of personal opinion as well as research. We're obviously not trying to sway you that all fan art is good or anything like that. You know, we just we're just hoping to open up your mind to this new route and you know make sure that you understand that while there is some negative, there can also be a positive. Okay, so with that in mind. Now let's begin with just something that I actually found when I was first coming up with this presentation um, a couple years ago that I found insanely funny. So it's, it goes, I hate when people go, I don't credit fan artists as real artists because it's fan art and they should draw more original art. Yeah, okay, that's patronizing attitude, it's nice and all, but every classical piece of art is fan art of the Bible. So you can go, I'm sorry, but the last supper doesn't count as real art because it's not original and you should make some seats. I think I just found the most compelling argument for a fan art ever. <laughs> <laughs> Which I fully agree with. <laughs> think about it. So, Rachel's going to start us off with the brain approach. Hey, friends. Good to see you. All right, so here are some nice, embarrassing relics from my own childhood. <laughs> um, so I've got a nice collection of uh, the classic Universal monsters having coffee, and also a kind of amalgamation pool party with characters from South Park, Foxtrot, Sanrio, like Kurofi's there for some reason, Batman, Superman, etc. Um, and a lot of these younger um, art pieces that I made are about me coming into my own personal style, but also through replicating other styles, and that's a big part about what I talk about here. Um, and I just want to also say that you're going to hear a lot of similar things echoed through myself and my co-panelists, so um, it's very exciting. We all have good things to say. Let's begin. Uh, let's start with drawing on the right side of the brain. So the name is a little misleading. Um, it's been previously thought that the left brain and right brain hemispheres worked independently, and they all had, or they both had different ways of um, being responsible for different functions, where the left brain was supposed to be more analytical, the right brain was more conceptual, but recent developments have shown that that's not actually the case, and that both hemispheres work in tandem. 
Um, but when I say drawing on the right side of the brain, what it really means is that it's um, isolating and creating a separation about the way that we think about the objects that we draw. Um, so it's a method of drawing that uh, takes steps to remove emotional noise from interpretation uh, of our ideas about objects and instead look for concrete shapes, lines, and structures from direct observation. Um, so it's kind of like when you draw a character from memory versus from direct observation. And this obviously goes to a much larger place beyond just drawing characters that are already made, but again, we're kind of circling back to the fan art part of this. Um, so it, in a way, it is like copying. Um, and it helps artists to build uh, a sense of awareness in their drawing practice. Um, as they draw more representationally, uh, think about how the lines intersect and connect to form a whole. So that is uh, the gestalt theory, right? How parts of the uh, individual parts create the greater whole. And being able to, to note some of those things is an important theory of visualization and conceptualization that has to be strengthened through opportunities that students have, such as these. Um, so a good example of drawing on the right side of the brain is the upside down drawing, which um, is basically when you take a drawing and you orient it in a way that changes uh, and abstracts it a little bit. And that way it further removes the artist from, again, that emotional noise about what we think of this interpretation. Um, so instead of looking at uh, a man, you would instead just see shapes and you really look more closely at some of those fine details and uh, it forces you to draw the image exactly as you see it. Um, this is a practice about shifting states of cognition and awareness through the literal or named states creative and abstract states. Uh, and in a way, it helps to build a more mindful and meditative practice for drawing as students engage with it more deeply. Um, so relating to motivation, um, catch up with the theory, okay. Uh, <laughs> so part of the recognition of this shift in drawing is about feeling attuned to the practice and the process, uh, separating oneself from the burdens of negative inner dialogue or learned perceived failures as an artist. Um, if you're not an artist, I'm sure you would be really happy to tell everyone, like, oh, I'm not an artist, I can't even draw a stick figure, right? <laughs> so being able to have some success and to find some, uh, you know, joy in the things that you're doing, and especially in this um, vulnerable creative space, is really important, especially as students learn how to, um, you know, feel more comfortable with themselves. Um, so finding success in this practice is inherent to attaining and retaining student motivation, uh, which is where the true learning occurs. Students will not learn if they don't one of the quotes I have here, students will uh, students need to feel successful and to make progress, and they also want to have fun with their friends. And that's from a Harvard uh, think tank called Innovate, um, which talks about uh, kind of the ways that teachers and other school officials can utilize student motivation in a meaningful way to help them gain more, uh, feel more successful at school. Um, clearly another reason to let fan art drive the boat is it captures student interest, right? It makes them feel successful, brings them together, you make a nice piece of fan art, you get to like feel proud about it, um, it's not just about self-esteem, though. It's also about um, referring to true accomplishment or achievement in something tangible. Um, so another quote here, piece of evidence, uh, relates more to the neuroscience side of things. Um, solving problems brings pleasure. When I say problem solving, I mean any cognitive work that succeeds. This is a sense, there's a sense of satisfaction, of fulfillment, and successful thinking. It seems undeniable that people take pleasure in solving problems. It's notable, too, that pleasure in solving the problem uh, that there is pleasure in solving the problem. Working with a problem with no sense that you're making progress is not pleasurable. So if you're continuously beating yourself up over doing the same thing again and again and again without feeling successful like you're making progress, it's going to create discouragement, it's going to make students feel less uh, engaged in the process and so on. Um, when students first practice and hone their observational drawing skills, the process can be challenging, especially as the students get older. So utilizing familiar characters makes this process easier and it feels safer. Uh, engaging with familiar figures and forms provides a comfortable starting place for students and allows them to feel some of those happier connections to their work, which makes them more invested in the process. Because there are going to be a lot of students, a lot of times, that you know, as they go along with fan art, they're going to want to try and perfect everything. This is something that all of us have probably seen, you know, whether you're an art teacher or not. If you see a student who's kind of doodling and they're trying to draw their favorite character, you're going to see them kind of keep going at it, going at it, going at it, until they actually can get it right. And in that sense, you know, that's their own sense of achievement and, you know, trying to make sure that they get the proportions right, they get the coloring right, they get all those other aspects right. And it's their own joy in seeing them get it, that, you know, they feel successful. Um, so, additionally, um, the practice of creating fan art can also help students to learn new styles of drawing and therefore new ways of seeing the intricacies of lines and shapes to create meaningful images. Um, this can be especially
especially valuable to students who feel stuck in a particular way of seeing and drawing. I know I've had a lot of students who feel like there's only one way to do the drawing all the time, and it really limits them in terms of where they can go creatively and conceptually. Um, one interesting study on the creativity of copying styles comes from researchers, oh gosh, sorry, Kintaro Ishibashi and Takashi Okada from the University of Tokyo. So this is a, an image from their study and a, a quote from their study as well. And the study revealed that over the course of three days, student artists who spent more time replicating other artists' styles first would later create artwork that demonstrated more aesthetic attractiveness, originality, and technical skill than those who did not practice through copying first. Quote, another explanation of this relationship between copying and creativity, as revealed by a post-test questionnaire, is that copying work forced participants to consider the form and style of the artist as well as their own. Copying pushed participants to compare their own style to someone else's and allowed them to think through aspects of their own drawings that they might not have otherwise questioned or considered. Good copying is not simply about getting the line or form correct, but about questioning why an artist is thinking a certain way and what they were thinking as they were working. Ultimately, this exercise generated new ideas. So uh, I also want to speak a bit about my own experience as a high school teacher working with art schools and colleges. Um, so while colleges don't necessarily want to see fan art in a freshman portfolio, um, the student artist who has become more confident in their work over the years through practicing, connecting with, and responding to their favorite artwork and favorite characters will be better equipped to build and produce a good portfolio. Uh, students who pursue creative careers, also in uh, commercial arts, will need to learn to replicate certain styles in order to be successful. So thinking about people who work for Disney, so on. Katie can speak more about that from her own uh, experiences. Yeah, so the thing is, that this is something that also got me thinking with the idea of fan art, is I've actually worked for several different animation companies prior to <coughs> I worked for Frederator previously, I worked for uh, Animation ne uh, Next Network uh, in New York, and I actually did work on one of their shows called Captain Mikey for, uh, for a couple months. Um, when I was going for an animator's test, they sent me a bunch of scenes that were unfinished. And the idea was I had to replicate how the character would look doing these movements. So I had to study the character sheets. I had to look at previous scenes that they sent me that other animators had drawn. I had to make sure I, had, I could replicate these flawlessly. At that time, I had only been working on Captain Mikey doing very limited with um, what's called shadow work, where I would go through frame by frame and add in shadows to specific characters. <laughs> and honestly, like, while that's exceedingly tedious, um, it does give you an idea of the sort of thing that you need to be able to do, because I also had to go talk to um, other animators who were, or other shadow artists who were basically bookending the same scenes um, that I was doing. Because at the beginning of Captain Mikey and at the end of Captain Mikey, um, they show the same sort of scene. And so I had to see what the same, what the other person was doing in terms of their shadow work in order to know what I should be doing for my shadow work. And so when I was doing that test, I was trying to think, see what everyone else had been doing and trying to make sure that I got these movements right and that the arms look the same, the face looked the same, everything else had to look the same because I'm part of an assembly line. And that's something that we kind of forget about when we see some kids who are doing fan art. If they want both for Marvel, they want to go for Pixar, Pixar excuse me, if they want to go for just any of those. They've got to work their way up the ladder. They're going to be part of the assembly line. They need to adapt their style in order to make it work. So it's one of those things where while we might discourage it, it's actually a good thing. So, so now we move yeah. on to the psychology of fan art. And showing first off. Line. Uh, my older works back in 2014 of Sailor Moon, yeah, that was a spin. And then, and then now I have more recent work, this was like last year, still doing fan art, but I put insert original characters in there. So, you know, so trying to slowly drifting away from really the fan art, but the basis is still the same. So, what is psychology? Let's start with. Psychology is basically the study of the human mind and the behavior that precedes it. So um, it's not so foreign for humans to actually take the latest thing and turning it into more fandom. So think about like the recent uh, phenomenons that we've been dealing with. 
Marvel, anime, video games, actually popular novels such as Harry Potter and The Hunger Games. Actually, they have something going on later on for our new book. Um, and how they impacted our society as a whole. Um, also the fact that fan art is not relatively new. You have, uh, you can compare the fan art to people who were inspired by books like Shakespeare and Edgar Allan Poe back in the day. Um, students that basically followed these great big names in artistry such as Vincent Van Gogh, Salvatore Dali, Picasso, and they would be considered during their time frame as fan artists. But we don't look at it that way. When we think of those big names, we're like, wow, they're, you know, they're they're the top of the top. But actually you had students just like you guys that were interested in those particular types of styles. Fan art today. So today we're living in the age of fan art. Um, proven by the popularity of the Marvel Cinematic movie where superhero movies were considered to be box office bombs, now they're, they're box busters and they're Oscar worthy. Black Panther being the evidence of that. The rise of esports, now you can get scholarships for video game uh, tournaments and such. The widespread of anime and of talking culture. So you had like recently Panic at the Disco, Robin Williams, they, uh, Keanu Reeves, all big fans of anime. Um, awareness and technology with the iPhone and just those particular type of fandoms becoming mainstream. Um, a lot of uh, the sudden growth is credited to a large lead to social media. So Instagram, Facebook, uh, Tumblr, several others, um, to, to just name a few, have caused a huge influx of uh, exposure to fandom no longer have to share these types of things by yourself. Now you can connect with people across the world within a matter of seconds to share these, these various um, interests. And for example, today's version or example of fan art, you have various different types. These are just some that I picked up, um, various categories that I came up with, like for instance, shipping. For all those who are Taku, Taku fans, they wrote romance fanfics, yaoi and yuri couples, of visual arts, you have shipping wars and do, doujin. And then you have imprinting, similar to some of you guys out there that are cosplaying, um, self-insert fanfiction, OC fan visual arts. So you could have like, um, so like cosplay fanfiction, so like this young lady here, I'm sorry. So uh, this young lady here and this young lady, is that over here? Yeah, over here. <laughs> Wearing cosplay of Miss Marvel and having um, fashion um, design of all the Spider-Man comic books, um, comic book covers. That's considered, um, can be considered uh, imprinting. Um, what is it? Fan favoritism. Um, you have things like, um, and then you have things like headcanon, which basically where fans come up with different types of theories after maybe a series is over, or there's a point in the series that they might might have liked and sort of like analyzed it and broke it down to the point where they insert their own particular theories and, and um, viewpoints into that into that series. So like for instance, Five Nights at Freddy's, then the, the Ink Machine, Undertale. Skeleton. So those are those are basically examples of fan art today. Um, right. So let's ask why do we do fan art? Um. So what do we do this out of boredom? Do we do this because it drives us? You know, anything of that nature? Well, actually, in reality, yes. Um. A lot of fans have stated that it builds up their self-esteem cosplay and you know constantly drawing those characters like my other panelists has stated that you know they find a com uh, comfortability to constantly draw these characters to also expand on their styles um, uh, especially pertaining to visual art it motivates them to perfect their skills such as like you could be a huge fan of spider-man or goku 
And you know, while they're drawing these things, um, they want to continue. Um, they want to make sure that they get the, every single detail correctly, like Pat stated beforehand. <laughs> um, and by doing this, their skills continue to be nurtured and grow from this. So, um, and also it causes their skill to grow at a much more faster rate. You know, you have that extra push, that extra motivation versus somebody who might be drudging with it, it might be arduous or laborious to them. They might not want to pick it up until like later on. But if you're like full on gung ho about this type of skill, you get through it a lot more easily. Um, and um, as a individual who likes who draws fan art myself, a huge otaku, I love anime, and that's where it started from. It started from a place of here's somebody who loves video games and Sailor Moon, continued with that type of drawing, and then here I am presently as a uh, person who runs their own little small business. Um, the reward system. Now, it doesn't necessarily just stop from comfortability and confidence. There has to be a reward system that precedes it. Um, it's very important um, when formulating fan art because you get sort of like a feedback from it. And the more positive reinforcement that you get, the more it encourages you to keep on going. So, like, so when you're doing like cosplaying and people give you like little suggestions, little sound bites or, oh, that's a cool cosplay or something like that. Hey, it's like, okay, I get this little little bit of a uh, spotlight and it will encourage that person to continue doing cosplay, to continue their skill of doing that fan art. Think about, like, especially with cosplay, think about like whenever you have a cool cosplay on, how many times people might stop and create a photo. Oh, that will be that, that will, that sort of boosts the ego just like way down. Yeah. Especially if they're like, work month, like months or even as short a time as weeks or anything along those lines. It's one of those things where that's just going to boost your back and oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so constructive criticism and just simple positive reinforcement can go a huge, uh, go a long way when harnessing a skill like that. So, and now to and unfortunately, though, there is always the dark side. We the life of teachers, so let's take a look here at some of my old artwork. Um, I have been, like, and literally, fan art is how I got into just doing art in general. So first, you have an entirely gel drawing um, from 1999. This was when gel pens were on the rise, yeah. and everyone probably remembers them. I all still the, have more. All the notebooks that have been <laughs> lost to gel pens. Yes, indeed. And then um, this, the second one is a uh, tribute piece to uh, Jason David Frank, who um, was here, I know, last year. And I actually created this design for him. Um, and that's all done in, that started out as like a sketch, but then came into the computer, actually. So that's a computer piece um, of combo of the green and white of the teacher. So, when we deal with the legality, first thing I want to do is let you take a look at this. <laughs> Let's try and follow the road map here. So, is it okay to use the image? Did you create it? Yes, then go for it. Did you create it? No. Then let's try and use our way through this thing. I'm not going to try and have us go through this whole entire roadmap. You have it on the presentation. If you would like a copy of the presentation, there are still some more copies over there. But this actually I love as a wonderful image to kind of help guide you. And if this is okay to use, is it not okay to use, and everything along those lines. So let's first start with what is copyright? I will not read this whole thing to you. Right now. <laughs> the only reason I did all this is because when I first did this presentation, I was by myself. I didn't have my two local panelists with me. Um, and I had a lot, so I had a lot more time, and I stretched this all out. Um, copyright, uh, which is where all of fan art falls under, okay, is the law that basically covers our right to use our work or allow our work to be made in a classroom or in an area where it can be okay. 
Here we have a wonderful quote on the idea of fan art from Josh Waddles up top, who is a lawyer for DeviantArt. And I'm sure every single one of us knows what DeviantArt is. If you don't, it is basically just nothing but fan art, although there is a lot of non-fan art on there as well. Um, so it says, copyright covers the expression of any original work of authorship. This includes the graphic elements of the characters, if they're fleshed out, not just sort of the notion of the character. Um, so let's say if you have a distinctive drawing style like Calvin and Hobbes, they can be the subject of copyright. You can use things that are not Calvin and Hobbes, but drawn in that style, and you could have yourself a whole copyright issue because you're kind of copying someone's style, although that's not always the case. So, um, it's marking your territory, all right? That's basically summing it up. It's making sure that everything that you make doesn't get all overblown. But in this, we also have some differences. So let's first talk about one of the main differences of fan, of, um, fan art. And the first difference is actually reproduction. This is something that we see a lot of times in the art classroom. We're asking our students to reproduce all kinds of artwork. So right here, actually, you actually have a, you have uh, Johannes Vermeer's The Music Room, or The Music Concert, or whatever, I forget, I think it's called The Music Room. So the, and that's on the, your left-hand side. I believe. I forget the others. Um, that's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, actually, you see a reproduction. That's done by a man who did a wonderful documentary. I highly recommend uh, anyone watching it, whether you're an artist or not. It's called Tim Vermeer. It's the name of the documentary. This, I forget the, the name of the guy, Tim something. I'm blanking on his last name. He actually went through the whole process of trying to figure out how Vermeer did his techniques. And it was insanely wonderful to watch. And this is the result. We're pretty spot on with this, aren't we? So, um, the idea of reproduction is we're imitating the work of, an, of a work of art, famous or otherwise, and it's we're copying it exactly. The difference when we come to fan art, and this is a lovely piece by one of my former students, is that these are works of art that are created by fans of a work of fiction, generally visual media such as comics, films, television shows, or video games, and they're derived from a series from a serious character or other aspects of work. This is something I enjoy doing with a lot of my students, and I'll talk a little bit further about this a little later, the idea of inserting a character they enjoy into a famous work of art. Um, most fan creations are, by their very nature, um, not parodied or criticized by the source material, um, which would provide a great deal of protection, nor are they highly transformative. And I'll go into that in just for a little bit. So the idea that if you're parodying something, you can actually be co uh, covered a little bit. Let's think Weird Al. Let's think Weird Al Yankovic, who parodies pretty much everything under the sun. <laughs> He's covered to a certain extent. The idea that you can be covered for from copyright issues, you have to have at least two different categories. Parody can be one, but then you have to pair it with something else, either fair use, education, um, portion of a whole, like sampling, especially when it comes to musicians. So within the classroom, we have, there are a lot of times when we're, like I said, we're asking our students to reproduce styles that we're trying to teach. In order to meet certain criteria of teaching, we use different techniques and ways to get the end result. Many times we invoke particular artists and their styles so we can teach the students what we would like them to be able to do. We might change the end result, but the students are still copying. <coughs> You're sorry. You're sorry. They're still copying. So, for example, this uh, the lower picture shows several student works that are meant to study Georgia O'Keeffe's floral work. The students had to study one particular floral piece, but then they also had to make sure that certain parts were three-dimensional. It's a little hard to see. I apologize for that. Um, but certain parts of those pieces are raised up using air dry clay um, on top of canvas. Um, however, outside of something like this, things are kind of get, getting a little bit blurry. So when we, right here we have a quote from the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for the Visual Arts. 
Teachers in visual arts may invoke fair use in using copyrighted works of various kinds to support formal instruction. That's basically what I was just saying. Um, but this is where things start to get blurry. As an artist, you have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not under the conditions that you allow your artwork to be reproduced, and if it is reproduced, with or without your permission, um, whether you want to go the legal route. If you, so, sometimes that can be to your benefit, and sometimes it's basically just a kick in the ass. So, why would something like this be important? Well, as we have previously stated, and as we've all mentioned, at certain points, we are asking students to copy a style, or sometimes we can copy a work of art itself, especially if we might be teaching art history. Um, the artist's right to, reprodu to reproduction is not infringed, are consistent with the fair use doctrine. So, the other issue, though, is how's it? What's it gonna, what's going to happen when they get out there, when they're starting to copy, and they're actually like starting to promote their work? We have two main factors with this. Number one is cost, because we have the bigger issue is the cost of going to war with the fans. Cost is everything when it comes to a big name company. Even big name companies like Hasbro can lose money if they're trying to go to war with their fans, because all of a sudden they're going to alienate everyone. And that leads to the factor, the second factor, which ties into the cost, which is loss of fans. As a company goes to war over the use of characters, they can slowly start to lose out their fans, and that leads to a loss in revenue. Many companies have learned that it's probably better to not to let people do their fan art and kind of just let it slide, rather than trying to fight them. Although there are obviously some companies that are big enough to fight and warn every single person, such mm -hmm. as Disney, Marvel, and Rice even has an issue with this. Yeah, but even Anne Rice has issues with stuff like this. So, um, so yeah, um, this next one is just a wonderful quote, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, um, but it talks about how it's, a, it's its own perfect ecosystem. You have the creators and owners who want to have the fans, you know the way to get fans is to have them show their love and admiration for your product with your own work. The more fans you have, the better they are at being fans, and the better that your work is, the better their work gets. So it's a perfect symbiosis, uh, symbiosis in this sort of cycle. Um, but that's also a paradox in and of itself. And so lastly, I want to show this sort of guide. Um, this is a kind of unofficial set of guidelines that was published in a article called The Messy World of Fan Art and Copyright. Um, while, like I said, while it's not official, it can give you a very good sense of what can be acceptable. I do want to point out rule number three which is where a lot of fan artists fall. Being non-commercial. None of us have to follow this rule. <laughs> I know I don't. <laughs> um, this is an element of the unspoken rule, but to try and be completely non-commercial with your own works, no selling copies, no sp uh, sponsorship, no advertisements, I don't really think I know of a single fan artist that really does this, so, um, except like a lot of my students, although I know many of them who want to like actually start selling their own work. Um, as a fan artist myself, I do actually go to, like I said at the beginning, I do have my own um, fan, art, fan art that I go and I sell. Um, and there is actually ways that you can become official fan artists. I know there are companies like Redbubble or, um, not Tico, but blank on the name, but um, they might have bigger companies that sweep through and see what work is, can be acceptable or not, and they might give you warnings or not. If there are companies that say, hey, we actually like this work. Okay, you can keep it up. We'll give you the license for it. That actually just happened to me not too long ago. I had a piece of work up for Samurai Jack and kind of forgot about it because nothing was selling. And all of a sudden, I get a notice one day saying from Cartoon Network, hey, we like this work. You can totally keep it up there. You are now an official fan artist. So, and, there, and obviously, there are also contests out there that talk about doing official you know, fan artist work that you can, again, sell. So, lastly, let's talk a little bit about how we can teach fan art, and Rachel's gonna start us off, and then I'm gonna finish this up. Okay. So, Rachel, these are your ideas. So here's a couple for me uh, from different age groups. So the first one is kind of for every age kiddo, um, and you're creating your own fan art by copying your work through your peers' eyes, so you can either create the original character or um, going back to the idea of drawing on the right side of the brain, you can use your imagination to think up a character that you already know of, like 
then it might come out in a different way. And then you just kind of round robin it around and have everybody draw that character, but it comes out in their own style. So it kind of is like game telephone, but yeah. visual telephone, which is pretty cool. Um, but that's also a nice way of seeing how an image can change and adjust through different eyes, and also a way to kind of be thoughtful about looking for particular styles that a student artist might have, so you can use them as an inspiration source instead of just what you're receiving from teaching your class and so on. Um, an upper level project that I do is in Style Of, which is a research and art project for high school students where they um, choose a particular artist and then research some of their stylistic choices. So in some ways it's less about replicating an existing work and looking at the entire uh, body of work from a particular artist and then looking for some of those key stylistic choices and uh, thematic aspects and then creating an original work with those as a guideline. Um, so you know, obviously we can go from like a really easy example of like Van Gogh uses the same kind of brush strokes, how can we apply that in a different way, um, to something that's a little more pointed and specific uh, for an artist that's less well known. So it's a nice way to again get out of your as an artist, um, but then also to do some constructive research about the light and the intent and all those other things about a particular artist that give us in the world. Uh, and then for younger uh, students, I have a What Happens Next project, which is always really fun. Um, so in this way, you look at an artwork and you have a critique discussion with the kiddos, and then they talk about some of the things that they've observed happening. So details like, you know, who is in this image? What is happening in the image? How do you know? What are some other details you can pull out of it? And using those details, they uh, will then draw a what happens next, as though it was next to the panel of the comic in that way. Um, and that way, they also are looking for some of those key stylistic uh, details, observable details, and so on, but then putting in their own imagination and imaginative twist on it so that they are thinking about conceptually what actions or movements or so on will lead us to think that what happens next would happen next. Um, and that can be also accompanied with some writing, which is really nice if you're trying to hit all those And to that extent, like these are some of the lessons that I thought that involved fan art. So fre uh, freshman fan art piece, I have thought high school before. I've noticed that when it comes to, especially freshmen, incoming freshmen, they're very hesitant. Um, at my previous school, uh, a lot of them were kind of like very new to new to the school. They didn't really know a lot of people because it was solely a high school. So um, what I would have them do is they were required. They had to take a famous work of art and replace some part of it with a character or a famous celebrity um, from their favorite show, comic, book, movie, whatever, um, in, inserting that person or character into the work of art in some way, shape, or form. My immediate thought with this that I would show them is think of Squidward from SpongeBob SquarePants who always likes to do himself in every single type of medium and every single type of um, the next one that I've done with multiple different grade levels is a little bit of a case study with um, Marvel versus Jack Kirby's kids. This was a big issue a couple years ago when Marvel was about to be acquired by Disney. Um, Jack Kirby's kids came out and we were saying like, no, we want some of these royalties. This is when Spider-Man was on the rise. Um, the students had to read the original article about this. Um, and answer prompted questions about who they think was right, who they think was wrong. I don't give any guiding answers. I make sure it's completely open-ended. I just give them the first article about it, and if they want to research it further, they can. The fun part about this is I tell them that if, like, whoever gets the topic, like, not answers, but whoever gives me, like, some of the best responses, I actually get a chance to send it to the judge who happens to be my mother. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was the original judge on that case, so I tell them, you know, I'll hand it off to the judge, and she loves it because she likes to give back feedback to those students. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and she has come in and talked to the students about that whole issue before. And it's, a, it's very interesting. Um, and one of the last projects I do teach or I have taught in the past is an idea of a final reproduction project where students are actually taking a famous work of art that was stolen from a selected time frame. And they have to recreate it to the best of their ability. So that goes back to the idea of copying someone as well. Um, and a lot of those pieces that I make them pick are stolen masterpieces. So two of the two of the biggest ones that I focus on are the um, if you think 
major monuments men, World War II. Uh, a lot of those artworks were stolen. There's a lot of them are still missing. That's still actually something that goes on today where they're trying to recover them. Um, and then the other one is actually the Barker Museum heist. That's another big one that's, that's actually still open as well. Um, so they have to pick something from one of those sorts of things or if they know of another one. And they have to move them to the best of their ability. And yes. Okay, so I am a teacher and also a fan artist. Yes. So a lot of artist alleys also, so there's, a, there's an unspoken rule, but a lot of artist alleys follow it. A lot of companies won't mind if you do a small run of printed fan art. Yes. They won't have a problem. The only people that really have a problem are Disney, and not all of Disney characters. Like yes. Mickey and those main oh, characters, God. they have a huge problem. Yeah. Although um, Disney almost lost their copyright with Mickey a couple, like I think it was like um, earlier it was this coming, year. Yeah, yeah. Domain, but oh. then they snatched it back. It's because yeah, of Disney that we have the copyright laws that we have right now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. before everything yeah. used to come up to public domain. Was it 50, every, every 50 years? Yeah, yeah. something along those lines. Disney was like, guess what we wanted for life? And we yeah. changed copyright law altogether. That's yeah. not a fair but deal most, for like. Most yeah. artists, alleys, and, and students, I work with young children. So yeah. my children are never going to be, we're not never, but they're not. It's certainly possible. I mean, I know a lot. Of, I've seen a lot of 3D, 3D, like 
Bowser, I've seen a um, couple of Pokemon, things like that. Yeah. And But that's a little bit, while it gets expensive, that's still a little bit easier to mass produce than something like that's hand done, I would say. 